Um, so the main purpose from my point of view today is to show you how you can use the tool to get better performance from teams. And, uh, and I say performance right from the start because most of my clients, you know, they enjoy it, they like the training, but the most important thing for them is um, do we get a better business result because of it? And of course, it's not always corporate, it's not always business, it can be academics, it can be uh, people in non-governmental organizations or in government, but they're trying to get better results. And, you know, how can we do that by understanding each other better? And if we think about teams, and I mean, teams have always been important, but these days um, with people working remotely and hybrid, this idea of a team and how to make it produce good results is sort of getting even higher up in the agenda. And the first thing I just want to show you is um, something I found quite recently. And um, can you see my strange slide there? Yeah. Um, you don't need to look at this in detail, but what it's really doing is show the, showing the mathematics of different uh, relations within a team and the number of lines of communication that increase exponentially uh, the more people are in a team. So, I mean, if it's three people, there's three lines of communication, then it goes on. You know, if you've got up to 14 people in a team, you can see how complex a web it is and how many things could potentially slip through the net. So just that as a, by way of introduction. Um, I would say when I'm working with Culture Active with teams, I would generally try to avoid more than seven people in the team, um, simply from the point of view that if you have to do your own profile and then do a mini profile on six of your colleagues, that's quite a lot of time that you've got to invest into it. Um, so um, it makes sense to do it with smaller teams. I mean, I was working with a team last week, there were about 20. They'd like to do it. So we've suggested breaking them into three separate groups who work together more closely with each other. So um, some of you may be familiar with the model behind the program. Uh, others may not. So I'll just very briefly mention it because it does help to understand what we're doing. Um, and don't worry, I'm not going to be lecturing you the whole time. I I'd like to at least try one breakout if that's possible, um, or even you could do it all together. Um, and I'll put myself off screen while you, you talk among yourselves um, for an exercise. But it's important to understand the model behind the program. And this is the Lewis model. It's in three parts. Uh, in the blue corner at the bottom, we've got what we call linear active, then multi-active at the top and reactive. And it's a way of describing behavior. Um, it's originally based um, or inspired by Edward T. Hall. And Hall had a few different uh, uh, ways of looking at culture, but one of them was to look at monochronic and polychronic culture. Monochronic was where people did one thing at a time. Polychronic is where people tend to do many things at once. And then um, what Richard did is that after he'd been living in Japan for a, a few years, he thought, well, I like this model, but it doesn't seem to quite apply to the people from Japan because they've got both monochronic and polychronic characteristics. And then he, he expanded monochronic to not be just about time, but also to be about um, whether you're more um, interested in facts or whether you're more interested in people and relationships. And so he expanded those and then created this new um, category, reactive. Um, and reactives, apart from the qualities that are listed there, are um, uh, generally very good listeners. And <laughs> Ron's looking dubious, but <laughs> I would say that, and of course with culture, you have to generalize. I mean, I'll give you an example. I was, I'm just back from Singapore, where it was certainly hotter than here. And uh, I was working with a very interesting group uh, from a, a, an awards ceremony called uh, Women of the Future Southeast Asia. And um, we had, I, I ran a training half day and then they had an awards ceremony. I, I, unfortunately, I missed it because the, the awards were presented by Jimmy Chu, who I would have quite liked to meet, uh, but I missed that, unfortunately. And um, 
I got them to work in groups and said, look, I'll give you 10 minutes. Discuss what you think are the biggest misunderstandings about people from your culture or cultures. And um, they all came up with very consistent answers. And they said that um, because we don't say very much at meetings, because we're listening, people think that we don't have much to say, whereas, in fact, we've got a lot to say. And, um, you know, um, we're, we're wanting to absorb information, react to it rather than initiate. And then if we do start speaking, well, then you interrupt us. And so we stop speaking and it gradually fades away. And it's a, you know, it's a big wasted resource. So we see reactivity as a very positive quality. It's not the opposite of proactive. Uh, you can apply the model to national culture. You can apply it to um, professions. So engineers would be quite linear. Um, multi-actives in organizations are often salespeople, um, marketing. And then reactives tend to be, well, consultants, um, business coaches, probably psychologists, psychotherapists, academics, and then some people and some cultures are mediators. Uh, we have discovered, because we've assessed over 100,000 people, and about 10% of those were very senior leaders, and we have discovered that globally, senior leaders are very often multi-active. I'm not saying that's a good thing. Um, you know, it has its advantages and disadvantages. It's just a fact, you know, maybe it's because they're good at talking themselves. Yeah. Um, okay, we're joined by George. Uh, welcome, George. So I'm not going to go in this in, into this in detail. This is simply a... Um, a more detailed description of the three different types. Um, in communication, linears are often communicating to give and receive information. Uh, Multi-actives, a lot of their communication is about building relationships, expressing opinions. You know, what do you feel about this from, rather than going into a detailed examination of the facts? Reactives, a lot of their communication tends to be uh, listening and creating a sense of harmony. Um, this is a very rough depiction of our research, and um, we've simplified it. You know, think of it like a map of the London Underground rather than a totally accurate map. And uh, so we've grouped cultures here according to how they've answered the profile. Um, and I think the important thing to stress is that it's also a relative model. So if someone said to me, you know, what about Southeast Asia? Can you give us a general guideline? I'd say, well, you know, if you want a really general guideline, and of course, there are lots of differences. Singaporeans are a little bit like the Germans of Southeast Asia. They're quite structured, you know, and it came from uh, uh, their former leader, Lee Kuan uh, Yun. Uh, I can never pronounce it very well, um, who was a Cambridge economist and introduced a lot of linearity um, to get the country on its feet. You know, it was um, sort of economically... Um, lagging behind Malaysia, and then he turned things, Lee Kuan Yew, yeah, he turned things around um, through linearity. Whereas Indonesians, Malaysians, Filipinos, a little bit more multi-active. We had Korea here, um, you know, generally reactive, but then if really pushed, it can suddenly let off steam and become quite emotional. So they're a little bit more of the multi-active corner. I can see Ron nodding there. I'm glad that this looks like you've got some agreement to, with them. Um, so it's a relative model. I mean, like any model, you shouldn't take it too seriously. It's a starting point. It's just a way of um, thinking and adjusting your thought processes and generating new ideas. And so, for example, if you apply it to leadership, then, you know, what discussions can we have about leadership based on thinking of, about it through this prism? Um, when um, I'm doing a long live course, two or three days, then I put people through an assessment and break them into groups according to their cultural profile. You know, did they come out more linear, more multi-active or more reactive? Um, but I've got some photos I've taken. You tell me, looking at this first group, based on what you've learned so far, are this team linear, multi or reactive?
Any thoughts? I'd say a combination. It could be potentially linear active because yeah. they haven't put much down on a piece of paper. It seems quite concise, but at the yeah. same time, they're listening. There's one person talking. So you yeah. could say reactive to some degree. You're, you're absolutely spot on. And you're the only, the second person in about 20 years. Uh, well, maybe I've not had this picture for 20 years, maybe in 10 years, who has said that. The, the, the previous one was last week. Um, someone said it. But you're absolutely spot on. It's um, the group are about half and half. I think two of them were Finns and two were Swedes. And both Finland and Sweden, predominantly linear active, but with a few reactive qualities. What about this group? This team. <laughs> Definitely multi-active. Multi. <laughs> multi -active, yeah. And then this one, well, obviously reactive. Reactive. And, yeah, and the listening, taking notes, very peaceful in, in that um, breakout room. And two of them are, you know, certainly appear to be Asian. We didn't put them in the group because they're Asian, because they've got high reactive scores. So... When you're thinking about teams, is your team more like this, or more like this, or more like that? And if you're like this, how would you feel suddenly having to enter a team like this? <laughs> and if you're like this, how would you feel if the team that you joined was like this? Um, so this is what this is about, and what our perceptions are. You know, how do the other two perceive this lot? Do they perceive them as rather cold? unemotional, not very exciting, dull, boring. Um, how would that first team see these people? You know, chaotic, no sense of time, um, emotional, too emotional. And how would the others see this team? Really quiet. Um, maybe not much to offer, as we said, when in fact they could have a lot to offer. Very slow in making decisions. So this is the sort of thing we're talking about. Um, this is quite an old piece of research now, but uh, because it's about human behavior, I think it still holds true. And um, on the vertical axis, you have um, price, the horizontal axis, you have, uh, sorry, not price, I'm confusing it with them. You've got the number of teams on the, vert on the horizontal axis, you've got, uh, you've got performance. And um, <clears throat> you can see the reference to the paper at the bottom there. And um, what these researchers discovered is that when you put new pe groups of people together, um, diverse teams actually tended to perform quite badly. Homogenous teams had quite a wide range of performance, but the best teams of the lot were also diverse. So what is it? Why does it sometimes work so well? I mean, they say, say here, manage poorly or manage well, but what are the characteristics of these high-performing teams? And the ones that they came up with, they said um, they were very good at mapping. So they had a clear idea of who they were, both personally and as a team. Um, they were good at bridging and they were good at integrating. So bringing lots of different elements to um, the table. Um, so we'll move on to Culture Active now and have a look at how we map people there and what we do to try and build bridges and integrate. Um, so if I just stop sharing this one and um, share um, Culture Active. Um, so can you see something different there? <laughs> right, okay. Um, so this um, that I'm going to show you is a, a real team. And um, but we've we've altered the names and the name of the company. So these are real results because it makes a lot more sense to use real results. And this particular team, um, when they approached me, they said, you know, we're a, we get on well uh, in general. Uh, we're a good team, but we're more like a group of people rather than a team. What we'd like to do is understand each other better, get to know each other better, see where our gaps and commonalities are, and understand what's behind it, and try to get a better um, understanding through that and better results. 
Now, if we look at this here, and it may have logged out because I've had it open for a while. Let me just um, see if this is going to work. I think what I'm going to do is, while I get this working, I'm going to give you an exercise and uh, get you to talk about it, and we'll see if we can get the, the thing um, going. It might be my um, connect. Well, it looks as though it's my connection here. So I'm going to give you a, an exercise, and um, if we just... Um, Um, move on. So the culture active 360. Right. So what I'd like you to do is have a discussion. And Cheryl, perhaps we could pe put people into small groups. Um, are you able sure. to do? That? Definitely. Um, so how we'll many get, groups? Um, uh, I think two groups. Yeah. Okay. Um, sure. Come up with as many reasons as you can as to why there may be gaps both cultural and psychological, between how people see themselves and how they're perceived by colleagues. And then, if you've got time, discuss how you as facilitators can um, help people close the gaps and build a better performing team. So the first one, why are there gaps between how people see themselves and how they're perceived by others? And then, how as a facilitator could you help close the gaps? While you're doing that, I'll try and um crank my computer up and get it get it working okay so if we give people 10 minutes yeah all right so i'm creating the rooms now i mean we've um started uh so the the other team who came in a little bit later we just started so you didn't um you you missed a very important thing from ron about saying it was um personality it could also be about personality which very often we start off with national culture as sort of just an emblem of difference. And then in these sessions, it quite often comes then to personality, but often it then circles back to culture again. So it's quite an interesting cycle. And the things are obviously interconnected. Um, as we're already talking to your team, Ron, Cheryl and Harriet, um, any other points that came out in the discussion? I'll join you for just a short time, but... If, you, if someone would like to summarise some of the points that came out of your discussion. Let's go and have a look at the programme now. And um, what I was trying to show you was um, a, tr a pre-triangle where all of these dots... Can you see a triangle with dots now? Yeah. Yes. Well, the first stage is to look at a triangle with dots with everyone's position which was calculated from their self-assessment. But this isn't that. I wanted to show you that first, but it, it's got a bug, I think. Um, so this, the black dot, is the team leader. Okay, that's not his real name, but these are real results. So that's the team leader. Everyone did a mini-assessment on him. And in the view of other people in the team, he came out here... So it just says Thibault by team member. He came out here at the other extreme. Uh, so there's quite a wide spread. And, and this guy's the team leader. What do you think about that? Uh, just by way of contrast, what I've noticed is that very often people who are quite junior in teams, people very often have a very consistent view of what they're like. If it's the team leader, very often there's a very big spread of opinion as to what they're like. Why do you think that is? In this particular case, um, they worked out themselves. Normally you can't see who it was. Okay. So they worked out themselves and they brought it up themselves that these two people actually worked in the same office as this guy. So they knew him better. Um, another reason I think and this is pure hypothesis, is that um, leaders of successful, diverse teams probably adapt their style a little bit when dealing with different people. And what I have noticed, because I can get behind the program, is that where you've got someone, um, say the team leaders here, if you've got someone who's more multi-active than 
they tend to rate the leader as more multi-active. The people who are more linear and reactive tend to rate the leader as more linear and reactive. And why is that? Probably because they're adapting. And so their experience of that person is rather different. And I do have somewhere the results of one of my real teams and where I was assessed. And it's quite interesting because I came out as a lot more linear um, on the team's in the team's view than I view myself. Um, and there can be different reasons. You know, Is it because I've lived in Finland for years and I've gradually become more linear without even realising it? Or is it because in the context of that particular team, it's another company I work with, um, that I'm not the leader. And so when I'm not the leader, I am nowhere near as much multi-active. I don't push myself forward as much as if I'm running things. Um, so there are many things, but it, it gets you to really think about it. Uh, and we can go into more detail. And what I always do is I always get, when we do the debrief, I always get the team leader to offer to go first. Why do you think I get the team leader to go first in the debrief? And in the debrief, we go through each person's results in detail. Any thoughts why the leader first? If the leader is going to say a lot about themselves, then other people may be encouraged to say more about their selves, themselves. You see what I mean? Um, if the leader was very tight and closed or they didn't have the leader speak first, then they might not be as open. And so I prep the leader and say, look, you don't have to say anything, but the more you say about yourself, the more it might be useful for the team. And then you can go into detail. I'll just show you a couple of examples here. So you can break it down into different areas. And again, remember, this is a real result. So if I click listening and speaking, Tibor, if you see him over there in the right-hand corner, in his self-assessment, he thought he listened most of the time. Most of his team perceived him as talking most of the time. A very simple thing, but quite an important thing, I think you'd agree, for Tibor to know. So at this point, I said to Tibor, look, do you want to ask your team why they think this? And actually, what they came up with was quite simple. They said, well, quite often when we're trying to talk to you, you're texting or sending an email looking out of the window, um, doing all sorts of things. He said, yeah, well, I'm multi-active. And they said, he said, of course I'm listening. So it doesn't appear like that. So then you get Thibaut to commit and say, Thibaut, will you promise that before we have the next session, you won't ever touch your phone or your computer while others are talking with you? Um, and then we actually practice a role play, a scenario, um, based on some of these things before the end of the session. Um, you know, for example, uh, I had one team where everyone said, we don't tell you bad news to the leader because you're so impatient and angry. And so I got them to do a role play where they told him really bad news. Um, and then, you know, he had to control himself. And then actually one of them said, um, have you got time this afternoon? Because we've really got some bad news and we want to tell you this afternoon. And will you promise to listen patiently and not get angry? He said, OK, I'll try. And then the next session, did he manage you? So you, you, it's a, you know, show the gap, get them to make a commitment, get them to role play, and then get them to uh, actually do it in real life. Um, I'm just going. I realise we're running a bit short of time, so I'm just going to show you. Uh, oh, Cheryl, you put your hand up. Yeah, um, just a quick question, Michael. Uh, this is really fascinating and very useful, and I'm just wondering how receptive people are to these kinds of analyses and then having to face a different type and act, you know, in a role play doing the other type. Well, I've really <laughs> never had a problem with it, really genuinely. I know that some of our partners have tried and some of them have occasionally had difficult moments. I think it's like, I mean, to use a sort of slightly odd analogy, People who are afraid of dogs get bitten by them more than people are not afraid. Um, because I'm not expecting anything to happen. or And also because if something does happen, I'm you know, quite practiced at smoothing it over and making it okay. Um, it just doesn't bother me. Um, and, um, yeah. and sometimes there are amusing things um, 
that other things that could be amusing. I try and get an amusing or a sort of humorous atmosphere going so that people are feeling comfortable. I wouldn't normally use do this as the first session. Okay. I do it after I know the group already mm -hmm. and they've got comfortable with me. Um, so just a couple of other things. I'm just going to change the team member here. And I think it's this one. No, it wasn't her. Let me just go back and see who it was. Could have been her. No, it wasn't her. I can't find it for the moment. But there's one where there's someone who was quite junior in the team. And nearly everyone saw her as reactive and she saw herself as much more multi-active and I'll just see if I can find it I... where could she be yeah. I don't think it's this one but that was a bit close yeah it's not that one anyway um, this uh, person saw herself as quite multi-active and the team were really surprised when they saw her results. And um, they said, you know, we're, we're very surprised. Do you want to speak about it? And she did. She said, I do want to speak about it, but it's very emotional. And she started crying, uh, which, you know, I don't try to provoke. Uh, but she said, what you've got to understand is that for the last six months, twice a week, I go to anger management classes. I'm quite a violently emotional person. And the team really rallied around and said, look, you know, you don't need to be as worried with us. If you've got something you really want to say, just let it out. We don't mind, particularly now we understand this. Um, you know, we'd rather that you didn't hold it all in because it must be taking you a, giving, you know, a huge effort, taking a huge effort to do that. Um, I'll just very briefly show you one more thing and then we need to start winding up because we're already one minute over. I mean, we started about four or five minutes late. Um, but um, I'll choose one more person again. It'll go back to Thibaut. And all I want to do here is show that there's also a section on values. And I'll just select one of them. Um, so on competitiveness, the darker colored shape there is where Thibaut saw himself. So he sees himself as very competitive. Nearly all the teams saw him as quite cooperative. The first remark from one of his team was, well, we'd better watch our backs then, you know, if you're competing with us. He said, no, what I mean is that I'm very competitive on behalf of the team upwards in the organisation. And so it unearths a lot of things which could have been causing problems or resentment. Um, you know, there was one team with a a Greek boss, and the others were all Nordics, and um, they saw him as very secretive, and he saw himself as very open. And when they got to the bottom of it, it was that he didn't copy people in on emails if they had no action points from them. And they took this as a sign of secrecy. He said, well, I hate being copied in unless I've got to do something. I thought I was doing it you a favor. If you'd like me to copy you in, I'll copy you in on everything. I'm very transparent. So it, it resolves situations sometimes. Um, so this was very much about, um, you know, cultural perceptions. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that the perceptions are also relative. So if I'm um, very, very silent, then someone who's a little bit more talkative than me, I might see as talkative. And in fact, with this Greek, he saw himself as quite linear his Nordic team saw him as highly multi-active. He said, but I don't talk a fraction of the time of my relatives in Athens. And the team said, yeah, but you talk a lot more than anyone in my family or in my workplace. And he said, okay, yeah, now I understand why he's... Been... And in fact, one of the main reasons he wanted the sessions was because he said, I can't get my team to say anything. I said, well, they're not giving it, getting a chance. Um, like I'm not giving you a chance at the moment. Uh, but uh, anyway, so that's that's how it works. Um, I'll just um, 
show you one slide for anyone who can stay on a little bit longer. And um, this is something which I found quite useful thinking about teams. And um, I've called it some Nordic enlightenment. And I've chosen three Nordic words from Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. And I've related them to a big research project that Google carried out a few years ago. And it wasn't a cross-cultural one. It was more about um, why some teams at Google performed so well and why other teams performed quite poorly. And what they discovered is, number one, that the teams that performed really well, basically people were nice to each other. Simple as that. They had a nice atmosphere. And actually, when you got teams composed of very high-functioning, high-performing individuals, quite often they weren't nice to each other. So the teams full of high-performing individuals often didn't perform as well as teams with more average performance where they were actually nice to each other. And the atmosphere was comfortable. It was cozy. And there's a Danish word, um, which some of you may already have guessed, which sort of summarizes this. Hygge. Remember to have hygge in your team, a pleasant atmosphere. Don't be nasty to each other. It sounds very naive, but it's, it's really true. The second thing that they notice is that in the really high performing teams, if they timed a 60 minute meeting and there were six people in the meeting, then they each spoke for about 10 minutes each. So the contributions were more or less even in the successful teams. And there's a very good Swedish word which means balance and evenness, um, lagom. Not too much, not too little. Don't speak too little, don't speak too much, but you may need someone to manage that process. And then finally, they really stuck to these rules. And so when I've done a 360 with people, you know, I always try to have at least one follow-up. Have you done it? So I'd ask the team leader, have you done it? You know, have you stopped playing with your phone? And he says, well, yeah, I think, I think so. And the, then I asked the team, has he done it? And they say, yeah, most of the time. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, do you remember that meeting the other day? When, you know, and so will you make a further commitment to try? You've got to really push it because changing behavior is difficult. You've got to be persistent. And so I've added a Finnish word, sisu which means persistence. Um, so make sure that you stick to the first two rules and actually make sure people are doing it. Anyway, I'd better stop the slides now. Um, if you have a few minutes, anyone who wants to ask it, wants to ask anything, then feel free. Um, it was a sort of a bit of a romp through, uh, but I realise I spoke quite a lot, but hopefully you got enough of a, an idea to see how it can be used and what it's about. Cheryl, you put your hand up. Yeah, so I... Am I off mute? Yes. Okay. I was just wondering if there's still a cost for trainers to use the platform 300 pounds a year. Is that still the same? Yeah. The, the idea, if you want to use it, normally you should go through um, a train the trainers course. Yeah. So uh, in the Lewis model and using this, um, and I know Cheryl runs wonderful train the trainer courses. This is a very specific one on one model and one tool and i know you use a diverse range of tools and models cheryl which is fantastic by the way do you want to say something about the upcoming training there is a training yeah, in rivers i, I will highly recommend it actually i've done it thank with, you with well, Michael. Nice. <laughs> it's um it's uh what is it the end of february 28th of february to the 3rd of march in the uk um but i think i put something on on your platform Cheryl. Yes, there is a, an event on the platform. If you want to know more about it, it's about the course where you can get certified in the Lewis model and you do the course. And then if you want to become a an administrator of Culture Active, which means you can set up your own groups, you know, thing you get it's I think it's about 300 euros now a, a year. Okay. Uh, but you get a lot of support. And then you also um if you sell it, you get a 25% discount. So um Normally, people make it up with their first sale, you know, whatever they pay. With the culture, with culture active, I wouldn't 
normally recommend it if it's like a short address for a large number of people. So I had a client, I'm doing a session for them in Dallas in March, and they've got about 100 people on it, and it's about an hour and a half. And they asked about Culture Active. I said, you know, I, I wouldn't bother because you, we're not going to be able to do it justice if we've got to talk about culture in general and get any use from the results in an hour and a half. Um, and this whole 360 thing, I mean, is it is it done just by – so you have to assess yourself, but you also have to assess others. Yeah. So it's it's two things you have to do, right? Yeah. So normally for the first session – I mean, I ran a course last week in the UK, and everyone did the assessment. There was about um, – I think it was about 20, 20 22 people on it. So they – They've all done the assessment. We had two days with them. We looked at culture in general. We looked at their assessment results. They wanted a particular focus on um, um, Asian cultures, um, Japan especially, but also Korea, China, um, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Um, so we did all that. But now we're going to split them into three separate teams, as I mentioned before, people who work closely together and do the uh, 360 with them. When you do the assessment yourself, it takes most people about half an hour. But the questions are vastly reduced for the 360. Okay. So instead of 60 questions assessing linear multi-reactive, when you're assessing your college, there's only 15 questions to answer. Instead of, I don't know how many questions, quite a lot of questions, I've forgotten how many, um, on values, when you do it yourself, um, you answer a lot of questions when we do it with the team the team votes first online automatically for which values they think their team would like to look at particularly and we limit it by to about a third of what you normally do um, so instead of maybe 60 questions they're doing about 15 or 16 questions so they choose which values and values the reason is that then it only takes about five to ten minutes to assess each other person in the team because otherwise, if you had to do half an hour on each person, it drives you nuts. Right. So, okay. Any any other questions from anyone else? You know, after 35 years in Finland, the silence is calming. <laughs> <laughs> it used to stress me out, but uh, not anymore. <laughs> well, I hope you got something from it. Um it was really a sort of skim over the surface or a bird's eye view um, of the program, but I hope you've got an idea of the things that it can do. And feel free to um, to contact me. Are, are there refresher sessions for those of us who already got certified, but it was a few years ago and I haven't used the, the platform since? Well, the, the, there are, there's been... <clears throat> The last few train the trainers I did, we've had at least three people come back who went oh, on it about okay. 10, ten years ago, and they did the whole thing again. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, they um, they were quite um, um, happy to come back, and um, and you know, obviously there have been new developments. I think none of those three had seen the three hundred and sixty before because it was developed after they um, came. So is it pretty user friendly? Like if, if you haven't done it in a while, you pick up the platform and you poke around in there, you can figure out how to do the 360. Yeah, for a multi active, yeah. Um <laughs> I mean, I'm the sort of person who throws away the instruction book. Um, yeah, me too. That's that's why I'm asking. Like oh. yeah. I, I think to my mind, it's quite intuitive. Okay. I mean, partly that's because I came up with the whole thing back in the 90s oh so, well yeah so obviously it's going to be easier for me because it you know i thought of it but you know i didn't do the technical side i think my one bit of advice and we do give even if people have been on the train the trainers we do give people the opportunity to have a brief online refresher free of charge actually with culture active um but i think my one bit of advice is don't be afraid of pressing any button because you, you can't break it. I mean, the only person who's ever broken it is me. <laughs> but in general, you can't break it. Um, so, but I have, I have some people who come on the course and they, 
they won't touch any or press anything unless they know what's going to happen next. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. It's designed for, in a way for people who don't need the instructions, who just press okay. the buttons and see what happens. So when you when you want to do the 360 and you purchase a set of users, let's say you have a group of 10, I don't know, people in a course and you, you know, Oops. you want them to do the, the culture active assessment on themselves, then yeah. is, it, is it something like if you're going to do 360, is it the same cost? And then do you add it into their profile from the admin? The um, When they do their original assessment, the cost per person is based on the total number of people. So, you know, up to 10 people um, in euros. Actually, I don't remember in euros. In pounds, it's um, £75 for an annual license for one person. But as soon as you get more than 10, you get higher numbers. It goes down dramatically. I mean, it ends up at about 20 or 30 euros if it's um, or pounds if it's a large. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Sliding scale. If we do the 360, um, you know, the feature is already built in to the program. Okay. Um, but there is an extra charge. What I'd normally do is I'd charge my normal training fee plus a thousand um, pounds um, because it is quite a lot of pre work to go through everything and, and make sure that it runs smoothly. Um, so, whatever your normal fee is, um, and usually given the size of teams that we're doing this with, it would be about half a day. Um, okay. If you, but, if it, yeah. So, so the 360 is is there in any case is what you're saying the option, yeah, but it has to be activated. You would, uh, right. as an end user, you won't see it. Right. Until the trainer activates the admin the or the trainer, trainer has to activate it. Okay. Well, I'll tell you. I mean, it's very easy. Um, you just um, go to back to the group, the original group. Okay. And there's a 360 button, and it says Start 360. Mm -hmm. And you just press the button. And then they go on their computers and do When their... they go back, then you, you've got to tell them to go back to uh, log in again. When they log in again, on the bottom right, it will say you're a member of a 360 process okay. or whatever. And you click on that and follow the instructions. Okay. So there's a notification that you should... So they get a notification that the 360 is being enacted for their group. And say you've got a group of 12 and only seven of them are going to do the 360 you can uh, cross their names off so you um, you know you don't have to do it with everyone in the group okay so for example, with the group i've got coming up there are just over 20 in the group so i'll set up three 360s you know three first. separate groups yeah three separate groups to do the three amazing so but it's good. But, I mean, they're the sessions that I probably enjoy the most of anything that I do. Because when you put up those results of the team, and these are people who know each other, you can see them leaning forward and looking at them. <laughs> and they're absolutely hooked. Yeah. Because people like to find out about themselves, about how others see them, how others are seen by other people. Right. They just lean forward and... You know, my colleague Rick at Culture Active, he's the technical brains behind it all. He said, don't they find it boring? You know, you've got a team of seven or eight people and you go through each one individually and, you know, it's the same structure. Not at all. I mean, they just really enjoy they it. They love it. And that's why I enjoy it. And because you really help them. You know, that team that I showed you, he wrote to me six months later and said, we've had the best performance ever. We think it's wow." of the training best financial results they were also in a, a survey um you know a, i forgot what they call them um you know an annual um, engagement survey and they said this year we did a lot better than last year we were well above average for the company we were well above average benchmark for our industry um and we believe that's because of the training so it it really makes a difference and that's why i like it I think Martina has a question. If, has a question yeah. if you still have time. Yes, yeah. just a quick question because you were mostly talking about face to face classes or training. Have you ever done it online? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Uh, quite a few times. Normally, when I've done it online, it's because, I mean, I did it online just before I went to Singapore um, a few weeks ago. And it was because two of the people from the original team 
just couldn't make the date. And so um, I did it online with them afterwards. And so I've done that um, quite a few times. Yeah, I was just asking because I have some people who are interested in doing that, but they're like not traveling as much anymore. So they were staying, you know, at their places and their companies or sites where they are. And so, yeah, I thought maybe yeah, it, it, actually, that. It, it actually works better online than, than many types of training. I think because it's so structured, because everyone has to speak. And you just go through them one by one. So it's not that you get that situation where it says anyone got anything to say, any questions, and then there's silence. Because because everyone has to talk. <laughs> they have to, because you're going through them one at a time. So it, 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 the session is actually, for someone multi-active, is structured in a very linear way, which makes it very easy to do it online. <laughs> right. Thank you. Very good. So if there are no more questions, I think we can wrap up the session. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Michael, for giving us your time today. And this has been amazing to learn more about the Culture Active Tool. And yes, it was part of my certification, but unfortunately I, hadn't, I haven't had the chance to use it. So it was great to have a refresher. And then also I think for the others to have an introduction. So... I guess if we have additional questions, we can contact you or should we yeah. write to Rick directly? Well, if it's technical, Rick, if it's um, about anything else, me. Okay, super. So thanks so, again. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks, everyone. Nice thanks. to see you all. Uh, Happy and, uh, holidays. Happy holidays. Happy yeah, holidays. Thank you. Enjoy holiday, everyone. Yeah. You Bye too. Now. See you next year, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. see you then. Okay. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.